Hey everybody, welcome to the cast. I'm your host, Matt. I'm Tyler. And I'm Steve. Welcome everybody to the Linux cast. We talk about Linuxy things. It's going to be an amazing episode, I'm sure, because all of our episodes are amazing. I mean, seriously, we have never had a bad episode before. Never. Last never. one kind of sucked, but what are you going to say? <laughs> 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 Anyways, this is the Linux cast. We talk about Linuxy things. Which uh, there was some housekeeping that I needed to take care of beforehand, but the stream has just totally messed my entire brain up. Oh, I am looking. Somebody asked me if we could start streaming to Twitch. I attempted it today. It didn't go well because <laughs> uh, uh, I I'm obviously not gonna abandon YouTube for Twitch. So I was gonna try to do both at the same time. The process didn't work out well at all because I was using a service that is shit. So uh, I will try again next week if I can find a different way to do it, but we'll see how that goes. But anyways, that obviously is the housekeeping. So before we jump into the main topic for the day, as we usually do, we're going to be going over the things that we've done this week in open source. So Tyler, you first, please. Mine's kind of easy this this week because I've been I have been doing a lot, but improved my hyperland configs made them a little bit more modular started using ly so i've got an actual display manager or login manager on my system i also have it running cmatrix so it looks nice so you like literally boot into my system and you get you know like the matrix style stuff coming down in a login screen so it looks it looks nice it's still in the terminal it's very lightweight i like it I'm trying to think is there anything else with my system that i've been doing not really. I've, I've done other stuff to my system, like configuring fonts and stuff, but nothing too big. I've updated my dot files and also I've launched a new website, which, which it, it's the same. Like if you go to my website, zany.org, it, it's still the same like domain, but the website I'm now using Hugo, it's much better. Like Hugo is very, very nice. I was putting it putting off trying out Hugo and stuff because I was wanting to either do something that was pure HTML CSS or maybe something that was 3JS more you know visual and like 3D but I decided I'd go ahead and give Hugo a shot and try it out since I hadn't and that was a really good decision very freaking good I I understand why most people use it now it is Extremely easy, and Markdown's great. So, yeah, pretty much what I, all I've been up to this week. I agree with you that things like Hugo are pretty awesome. I've been using Eleven D because that's what yours set up for me. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> he does all the work mm -hmm. for me, apparently. <laughs> Steve, what you been up to this week? Moi? Yeah. Okay. No, no, uh, no, 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 no. The other Steve. What are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> the other Steve. The one next oh, to you. <laughs> the, the, the other guy. <laughs> it's your turn. Come on. Okay, you're back. <laughs> okay, I'll do it all for you. Okay, so what he has been up to is, well, for the, for the sake of repeating myself, still doing the Docker container on my system, but this time not exactly on my system. Now I have a VPS because Kudu being Kudu, he got me into getting a VPS, a cheap one, a, a dollar a month, kind of <laughs> cheap one. I get 512 megabytes of RAM one CPU, and 15 gigs of storage. Okay, since I'm hosting my own Vault Warden or Bit Warden instance on there, and uh, my thingy of the week is hosted there. I'm not going to say what it is right now. I'll say it when it, we, can, we get to the nuggies of the week. I'm going to say what it is right now. I'll say it when it, we, can, we get to the nuggies of the week. Because spoilers. So, um, but <laughs> Docker container. Docker containers. I can't stop. I can't stop. I. It's like the more the more you give me, the more I want. And I've been working on my private website thanks to the kid over here, Mr. Zaney, using Hugo, which I I second what he says. It's pretty damn easy until you hit a snag where you're using a theme that doesn't have responsive images or centering. The concept of centering or responsiveness. If you use a theme like that, you're gonna get yourself in a deep hole so i recommend get yourself a theme that supports all that out of the box rather than putting in all the work yourself but other than that it's pretty easy it's just markdown file you just create a folder called posts and you just for each post create a folder with a markdown file for each post create a folder with a markdown file that's it that's all hugo is 
a bunch of markdown files. Mm -hmm. Just select the, the right theme from the beginning, make your life easier than, than the, the one I chose. But uh, I've been doing that, and I've been finalizing work on Zero Linux for this month, uh, the Christmas edition. But other than that, no, that's it. Cool. Would have been hilarious is when I interrupted you about a minute ago if you said, shut up, man, I'm talking. <laughs> that would have been funny. <laughs> I don't say that. You're the boss. I don't say shut up to my boss. I don't uh, say bad words to my I boss. I would have laughed. It would have been hilarious. Uh, <laughs> 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 anyway, anyways. Um, I respect my boss. I respect my boss. Well, you know, that's, that's a good trait, especially if you want to get hired. <laughs> <laughs> <With> <laughs> something might look for. All right. So I've been doing something stupid. I have been using GNOME for four days. <laughs> so I started a challenge. So I've been, I'm very keen on challenging myself to do things that I don't want to do. And I decided that I was going to spend some time in GNOME. Now, I've used GNOME, obviously, in the past many times. And I even did a, a, like a 30-day review of it about two years ago. And I decided I was going to spend some serious time in it, this time with six months in it and good god what was i thinking oh god it's so bad <laughs> so bad uh, it, all right it's it's it, it, i'm being dramatic obviously it, it's usable but man you have to just just fly through the extensions to get it to actually be usable at least for me i know a lot a lot of people use vanilla gnome i don't understand those people like they can use it like i've seen people do it like they, they, some people swear by vanilla like they just got the key bindings down and all works for them and it's they're just happy with the way GNOME made it. But I can't do it. Like there's so many things that I just don't like the way it works out of the box. So I install the extensions and I'm not looking forward to the next GNOME update because I'm assuming that everything's going to break and it's just going to be horrible and I'm going to cry and all that stuff. So it's, it's going to be, you know... It has been an experience, and I, I will say one other thing I will say is that I've done some posts on Mastodon and on Discord, and as defensive as the NixOS and the Emacs guys are about the things that they love, the GNOME guys are way outshining them. They are very, very defensive about GNOME. If, I, if you say one negative thing, whoo boy, you just murdered their baby. It's bad. <laughs> I feel I feel the same way about Hyperland the way you feel about GNOME. But hey, I'm going to I'm going to give it a shot just to make just to make a video with uh, with our boy Tyler here. So um, wait. Hold on. I was smiling and thinking about this for a second. I'm like, "Good Josh or Josh Matt is ta is talking about GNOME, checking out GNOME." You know, you're checking out Hyperland. This is great. And then it hit me in my brain. I was like, wait, I don't like KDE. Am I going to start checking out KDE here soon? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> so what we should do is everyone has a challenge to use the thing that they don't like so that they can empathize with the people who do like it. That's the that, that's the challenge. You know, use something. The that challenge you... I already I already begun in my VM. I have Hyperland with uh, Zany's config inside of VM, gotta be but don't do that. On hardware, it doesn't count. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. Well, also, just so we're clear, too, for anybody who is going to check out my configs and wants to do it inside of a VM, I, I didn't know this, but inside of VMs, I don't know what it is, Hyperland, or maybe my, my specific config for it, it does not play nice, like, at no, all. No. It does it's not, not only like your it. config, it's Hyperland. It's Hyperland. Okay. It doesn't okay. work nice in, inside VMs. I have, a, I have somebody else's uh, config that you can run from a minimal uh, Arch install. It will install Hyperland. It will do everything for you. But as soon as you get into Hyperland, try to open a terminal. It flickers and it's not there. It, everything flickers. It's, uh, it's slow as heck. Don't do that in a VM unless you're doing pass-through, GPU pass-through. But if you're not, don't try Hyperland inside a, Wayland inside a VM. Window it's not made for that. Wayland compositors in in VMs don't work very well in my experience. Like none of them do. Just just nope. just don't. Now GNOME and KD seem to work okay with Wayland and a VM. So those are know. desktop environments. Yeah, it's different. They have a whole bunch of stuff that makes magic happen. Also, a shit ton of bugs. <laughs> KDE, looking at you. All right. <laughs> Anyways, uh, let's go ahead and jump into the main topic. So this week's topic came from us from Mr. Tyler. So Tyler, why don't you 
broaden our minds and, and our horizons with the topic for this week. I don't know where that came from. I was, you know, going to be grand and extravagant, but it didn't work out. It so sounded well. good. <laughs> I liked it. So I guess we can start it off with uh, the question that I initially asked was when it comes to documentation, is documentation overall getting better? But the conversation can definitely be had even if that's the question the conversation of the importance of documentation and ma good manuals good just in period good documentation no matter how you're doing it is one that's i i don't know if it's not talked about enough in linux but it's it's one that's highly overlooked in a lot of places the value of having good documentation it's really freaking hard to beat, like especially if you want to get people onboarded onto your project. So I, I guess since it is my topic, I'd like to have you guys just pick it up and start talking. Like, what do you got to say? Arch Wiki. First thing that comes to mind when you say documentation, the Arch Wiki, since most of us are on Arch. Well, except boss here, boss man here. <laughs> Open Sousa for the win. Sorry. Yep. Uh, no, but uh, uh, seriously speaking, the Arch Wiki is one of the most amazing uh, documentation wikis out there. But my beef with it is documentations should be more like the Hyperland documentation because the Hyperland documentation, Fox3 and, and company have done such a great job. And it's, it's, it's the way it's laid out, it's more humanly readable by any average Joe. Whereas the Arch Wiki is more for the, uh, I know what I'm reading. I understand what I'm reading. No, the average Joe is going to go like, it's a lot of text. It's a lot of code. It's a lot of commands. But what do they do? I don't know. They just tell me to run the code. I will run it. Oh, my system is broken. Oh, shit. Whereas the uh, Hyperland, they tell you, run this command. If it goes wrong, then do this. They, they, they. Uh, in the Hyperland uh, documentation, they cover issues that might arise by doing every single thing. Whereas in the Arch Wiki, they tell you to run some uh, something. If it breaks, well, you're on your own. Uh, you f you backtrack. You you should be knowledgeable enough to to backtrack to undo. To... The the Arch Wiki expects you before you come in. Expects you to know things before you come into their wiki. Like uh, to, to to have a basic Linux knowledge before you come in. With the Hyperland thing, I don't feel that you need to have a lot of basic knowledge because it's not very technical. It's like written by humans for humans. Do that's you, how I feel. Do you think that that's because Hyperland's a Wayland compositor and Arch is a distribution? That they're just kind of two different things? Or do you think it's because the Arch wiki is a wiki and the Hyperland stuff is not like a real, it's, that's just a series of website pages that aren't really, that go to, well, according to a table of contents. I don't, I don't know what Steve, Steve's opinion on that, that question would be, but my, my point would be, I don't think it has any, I, I don't, I don't know that the Arch Wiki is like even compare, comparable to the Hyperland Wiki only because the Arch Wiki, like the reason they don't, are a little bit different than the Gentoo wiki is the arch wiki expects you to have read their documentation on their methodology and like how the system is built or de designed to function and the wick the hyperland wiki has the advantage of they don't have to explain to you how hyperland works because for nothing in that documentation like you interacting with hyperland like for you to change config options you don't need to know how those configs work behind the scenes to stop problems happening yeah. elsewhere. Arch, on the other hand, does have that problem because you could follow their documentation perfectly fine, but if you have, let's just say, another program installed, it could change things, cause problems. And I think that's where the Gentoo wiki solves a lot of that problem. Like the Gentoo wiki is very different than the Arch wiki. The Gentoo wiki expects you to know absolutely nothing before you read like if you go to the hyperland like gentoo wiki documentation it's actually for gentoo better than the hyperland documentation because it explains to you 
what Hyperland is, how to install it, configure it, all the things that you need to make sure are going to be there for pretty much any system that's going to run Hyperland on Gen 2, where Arch, it like, let's just, I don't think Arch has a Hyperland page that's even comparable to something like this at all, but if they did, most likely the way that they would go about it is the same way that they do most of their wikis where you should have a base knowledge of arch before you yeah exactly what page. i meant i'm sorry tyler you got you you said exactly what i meant darth vader said in the chat says that's because gen 2 users don't have issues <laughs> I, I, I could not laugh <laughs> So we got another Josh in the room. Uh, Josh is Josh is out there, man. <laughs> like he should have a correct Like we got all we have all the issues. <laughs> Sorry, that was very funny. <laughs> so let let's talk. So when we talk about the pro, the golden examples of documentation in the Linux world, we 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 hold up three pillars, right? We have the Arch Wiki, the Gen Two Wiki, and the Linux from scratch documentation. Right, you have those three yep. things that are like the the, the pillars of wh when think people think great documentation, that's what they think of. So we ha in the in the chat we have people arguing about Arch versus Gentoo, which is I find absolutely hilarious. <laughs> but what do you guys think when it comes to that? Do you think that the let, let's talk first a little bit about you know which one you think is better, but. Which, because they all do things in a slightly different way. I mean, LFS and Gen 2 are kind of similar where they have kind of like a path that you follow, you know, that you go through, especially during the installation part of it. Whereas Arch just kind of feels like it's, you know, it's it's like kind of like Wikipedia. It doesn't have a start page. I mean, it has an installation page, but then once you click through it, you know, you can end up in any number of places like a maze, right? So, would you guys yeah, think it branches better? off infinitely? Yeah, like you can end up, I mean, in literal rabbit holes on the Arch Wiki. And I'm sure you can do the same on the yeah. others, but it doesn't. F the Gen 2 Wiki specifically, I've never done LT uh, LFS, so I don't know for sure. But the, the, the Gen 2 Wiki has always felt like, you know, literally, like there's even forward and next buttons on the bottom of each page, right? You know, you're done with this page, you go yeah. to the next page. You know, the, the Arch Wiki is not really like that, right? LFS, just so you know, is is very similar, if not the extreme of that. Like Gen 2 has the like next pages and leads you on. The LFS, the LFS book is literally a book that like if you skip around in, you're gonna have problems. It is straightforward. You only move linearly through it. Gen 2, like they guide you linearly, but you can bounce all around and do whatever you want, and there won't be problems. In most cases. No, no, Darth Vader said problems. Gen 2 LFS, users don't have will. issues. <laughs> Gen 2 users don't have issues. What are you talking about, man? <laughs> well, Josh did say something that is pretty true with Gen 2. Like, most of your problems will be down to you. Like, it's not really a problem with Gen 2. All, it's all a problem Linux, with something you're I mean, doing. Come on. Let's be honest. All Linux problems all, yeah. are user problems for the most part i mean most most of the time unless you're using kde in which case it's definitely a kde problem <laughs> I, I just love pissing the kde guys off like, like it's just become a hobby for me <laughs> i'm pretty i'm pretty thank sure, you i'm pretty sure nicolo hates me <laughs> i'm pretty sure uh, at this point <laughs> i saw matt or uh, steve's face change he was like <laughs> uh like, kde's just fine gnome for the win <laughs> There you go. <laughs> Matt, stop preaching your love affair. Yes. <laughs> I hate you know. Anyways, let me talk about this for a second because I don't know if you guys, how many people actually knew that Ubuntu actually has official documentation? I didn't even actually know that they had official documentation that you could like download and look at in PDF form. It's hilarious. I, I didn't did. know it exists. Granted, I've never been in an Ubuntu I user, did. so uh, I was surprised. But here's the thing and i wonder how many people are like me and how many people are like you guys because i didn't know uh but ubuntu because ubuntu is the most popular distro they're they have a big problem in that people don't search out their documentation probably or at least their documentation isn't surf surfaced in like seo instead when you you when you hunt for a, a pr problem for ubuntu you're gonna get some random joe smo's blog with the solution Probably from like mm -hmm. 1404 or 1608, 
16 10 or whatever i mean you know you, you, that's where the seo is going to point you in you're going to go searching through blogs and you're going to maybe you'll maybe you'll find a help ubuntu article or something like that but that's the way that but when you search for a problem on arch you're probably going to get linked directly top with the arch wiki like if you search for a problem on arch it's going to come up the arch wiki is going to be the number one result probably or close to the top whereas ubuntu because it's so popular and so many people are out there writing articles about how to do things and how to fix problems that stuff kind of buries the ubuntu documentation to the point where if you're like me you didn't even know it existed so i think that my question is this do you guys think that third-party documentation is an issue specifically when it comes to an ubuntu ubuntu but are other or do you think that community con contribution in the form of like blog posts can be helpful even though they age fast well Steve? to answer to answer that question i would have to go back to the arch wiki because i just discovered recently thanks to Antis, an arch maintainer uh, or package maintainer i discovered that the arch wiki was written by the community for the community it's you can uh, anyone can contribute to it and that's why it's so big anyone is can contribute to it so when you say third party and community people can contribute yes i i would prefer it but only if it was in human language not in arch wiki language well i mean with the arch wiki you have some form of control like there i'm sure there's probably moderators or whatever there that yes. go through it right yeah, uh, of course i'm t i'm more talking about like the like random mats on the internet who are out there writing how to articles on ubuntu 20.04 and then, but it, it, they require moderate moderation. Those well, still require moderation because it could be a guy you're writing according to your knowledge, but maybe your knowledge is limited and you're saying something wrong. You might be steering people to the wrong direction. Right, but they for example, they may require modification moderation, but they don't get it. Like you can post whatever you want on the internet, and then if you're really good at SEO, that thing floats to the top, and that's what people click on. And you may be leading. Yeah, that astray, could be a problem. Right? I, I can see that get, this can be a problem because not uh, maybe uh, the 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 guide you posted is what works for you, but might not work for somebody else. And if it's not well, moderated and it, it makes its way to the top, that person is going to follow it and he's going to break his system. And oh boy, well, that will lead I to mean, problem. E e even a bigger issue with that is. As somebody who knew that Ubuntu had documentation, I have never once needed to download it or use it because for even though it may exist, Ubuntu is so synonymous now that the documentation for Ubuntu is quite literally Google's results. Like that's that's like sure there might be documentation out there, but for most people you're going to find the information that you need easily accessible anywhere else other than the documentation because the documentation is not i mean correct me if i'm wrong but matt since you were you brought this up does do you know does ubuntu still like do they only provide their documentation as pdfs no it's there's an html page okay. as well um okay. but it's literally just the pdf in html form it's, it's like they took the pdf and then pan docked it out into html Oh, uh, <laughs> gotcha. Yeah, but it, and it's basically the same for every version. It looks like I'm sure they updated a little bit, but I, obviously, also they had this really. I, I don't know if I can sh have this set up so that I can show you guys, but on the, not you guys, but at least on the stream, people they had this really weird like background that's like dot matrix or something like that, and if you scroll, it like seizure alert at you. Um, so that's really bad design, but I just don't know. <laughs> so the reason why I brought up the Ubuntu thing is because the other day I was searching for something. I don't remember what it was, but I searched for a problem on Google that had to do something with GNOME or a uh, GTK application. I don't remember really what it was, but it had to do with something that Ubuntu also used. And the top result was for someone who had the solution, but it was for 1204, which, by the way, is 11 years ago. And my, my biggest issue with, with that whole solution that people seem to kind of gravitate towards for Ubuntu is that because Ubuntu has been around for so long, I mean long and has been popular for so long, a lot of the solutions for the things that you might still have problems with are for really old versions. 
And you don't, I mean, sometimes that stuff still works fine. You know, a lot of things don't change that often, but sometimes you, you do a solution for 1204 on 2004 and you're in trouble. So when I think of die, because that's the thing that we should talk just to get to bring us back around to the main topic instead of just focusing on Ubuntu is that when people have a problem, they don't like if, if you're brand new to Linux but for whatever reason you decide you're going to start on Arch, you don't know. Maybe you don't know that the Arch Wiki exists. So what do you do? You do the same thing you do with everything. You go to Google and you expect Google to point you into the right direction. And I mean, you you guys probably both provide tech support for other people who aren't as technically you know adept as you guys. You probably know that when they Google something that they don't know, what do they do? They click on the first result. So if the first result isn't the thing that the Linux community would like them to be pointing towards the official documentation, then there could be some, you know, issues where, and that's the reason why I brought up the Ubuntu thing is because whereas with Arch, you usually get the Arch wiki right to begin with on Ubuntu, you don't. And it, true. And he killed the chat. It's awesome. <laughs> so Tyler, <laughs> let, me, let me ask you this question. Let's just see if I can fix this. Uh, why did you think that, uh, documentation is getting better well I, I wouldn't say i think documentation is getting better just like like i don't really think that like gen 2's documentation is getting better arch's documentation is getting better and i'm not saying that like that in a bad way i don't think they need to get better there they are i mean there's a reason why most people refer to the arch or gen 2 wikis they're really good documentation but since I can switch over my screen to my desktop, I can load up if I go to this website here. So like w one of the things that like made me interested in talking about this is this kind of documentation over here. Cause th so this is the theme that I'm using for my website and it genuinely does have some of the some of the best documentation I've seen in a while. For one, documentation like this is getting more prevalent for a lot of projects where you know they have a good table of contents. The documentation is well laid out. It's themed well, so like you can delineate what's code, what's not, links, all this stuff. And I'm seeing projects and do and documentation related to projects starting to get better at formatting and the readability of them. And to me, I think pr smaller projects with this kind of work behind them is getting more, more prevalent. Like a lot of people are not just overlooking documentation anymore. And so I wanted to talk about it and see mainly at least at one point have you guys started to notice that the smaller projects that you use like i'm trying to think of good examples but like things like tofi like you know your little program launcher or like you know your notification center some small some small aspect of your system the do those smaller projects to me it seems like a lot of them are starting to actually get documentation that you would normally see with projects that have like a team behind them, not just one guy. So do you think that's kind of what sparked this whole conversation? Do you think it's because it's easier than ever before to have, like you no longer have to pay for a VPS or anything to have a website. You can just use GitLab pages or GitHub pages. Also, uh, I don't know how long that these features have existed, but w both GitHub and GitLab have wiki systems, right? That you can actually use as your documentation system. If that's what you want to do, you don't have to host it yourself. And all that stuff is just done through Markdown. So I, I wonder if the reason why it seems like things are getting a little bit better, even for the smaller teams is because it's easier to host than it was before. Whereas before, a lot of people like, and I'm going to bring this up with love because I love man pages. Like man pages are great, but if you've ever went spelunking through man pages, the variation on quality of man pages is enormous. So some, like if you go to the Vim man page, it's fantastic. You can spend days and days reading it. Uh, whereas, you know, the bat, the man page for BSPWM, eh, it's okay. It's not as good. 
you know? So that was kind of like the past, whereas like now it feels like it's easier to put that kind of stuff online because you don't have to worry about, you know, web design. You can use Hugo or you can use 11D or whatever if you want to have like an actual website. It's really easy to do. Maybe that's one of the reasons why. Also, I think that there's like a element of shame of not having good documentation, whereas before it was like, and we don't have time for documentation and because uh, we have development work to do now nowadays if you don't have good documentation there's kind of a a, a community shame there that you, you know kind of forces you to at least have something although it doesn't seem to affect the suckless guys any just put that out there <laughs> they, well, those guys don't give a don't fuck <laughs> they don't give a fuck <laughs> <laughs> what do you say steve well i would yeah i, I just wanted to to, say, uh, to chime in by saying that Small small group documentations are easy because, as you said, it's easier to host. But number two, if the project is small enough, yeah, definitely. The documentation is going to be great and easy to follow. And if the project is big, still it's going to be easy to follow because it's written by a couple of people, and especially if the project is not very complex. Those kind of uh, document small group documentations are going to be awesome to follow. Like that, and I'm going to uh, let you out of your prison, Zany. Yes, the Hugo documentation is one of the best I've seen out there because it's by the by a small group, and the fact that they have each theme has its own documentation built into the preview. Yeah, that is amazing. Like you go to preview the theme. The documentation on how the theme works is in there. Same for WordPress themes. WordPress themes have the documentation in the preview. So I, I prefer small team document based documentations because they're talking. And I think it's because they know the type of people who are going to read uh, their documentation. But they are very... It's like asking ChatGPT to talk to me like I'm a twelve-year-old. Well, I think it. I think it's mainly just because, like, I mean, you don't, you don't, ha you don't have nearly as much cruft to go through, so you can explain yeah, the smaller exactly. little aspects better. Yeah. But even then, like, one team, like small, like pr pet projects, essentially, are have really great documentation. Well, I mean, not all of them, but it seems like the majority of them are started. Like, I'm trying to think, uh, SWW. There you go. That's a that's a good one. I've just recently started using that. Documentation on that is phenomenal. And as far as I know, it's made by just one dude, like, you know, messing around, making a wallpaper setter. It's very, very good. I think that part of it is that a lot of the, the – because a lot of the stuff that has been created in the last few years, when they created it, they started the documentation as they were developing it, right? So they started at the beginning because it's a lot easier to yeah. create your doc documentation as you're developing something and then you know edit it as you go through, then code something, develop something, push it to everybody, and then go back and do the documentation because that 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 really seems like more of a chore than just doing it bit by bit as you go along. I think that a lot of developers these days have gotten into the habit of doing it right from the beginning like you know that's one of the first things they do they create their github project and they get you know they, they create their base c project or whatever they're going to do and they also create a readme right there along with it and that's their basis for the beginning of their documentation and they just kind of branch off from there i think it makes it much easier if and you guys gotta remember that i don't really know this for a fact but it feels like in the past it was more of a of a do it afterwards like the documentation was always last on the list because it was the least uh, it was their last priority whereas now it just kind of something that happens as they go along and again it's not everybody oh. but some of them and there are, uh, uh, there's another type of documentation that uh, that Zany didn't mention or anybody thought of but the guided documentation the interactive type of documentation where they uh, where if you download a package for example, you run the package, or you run the app, and the documentation is a guide with bubbles. It could be either bubbles or a video that starts up when you start the app, or those kind of those kind of things. Well, actually, you brought up a good point because I think that's going to get much more popular. 
over the, yeah. like, the next few years, like having programs that have like, maybe, maybe it's not like when you first launched the binary, but cause like, I, f I feel like that could get annoying. Cause you know, like you could just be reinstalling it on a new system and you don't want to go through a tutorial uh, again or have to skip it or any of that BS. But like, I, I think probably the best way of going about it and will probably get very popular is things like, you know, how Vim has its Vim tutor, like yep. programs like that, having their tutorial, like documentation where they walk you through the program and the yeah. program functions differently than it normally would to walk you through everything. Like, I think that's going to be po like, that's going to get very popular and it's probably the best way of going about doing it. Cause you're not just like, it's not just a resource for someone to go back to and learn how to use it. Like it's, it's literally a tutorial and you're guiding people through it. That's yeah, definitely better. Of course. And there's another reason that that this will become better in the future because the more we go the more the, the more time passes the less people have the attention span to read the entire documentation like the the le the, the longer the the guide or the wiki the less people want to read uh, let me ask you, let me well ask and you. i mean that's a go ahead. No, go ahead let me ask you guys a question just real quick do you <laughs> unless you're in like an uber nerd uh, like us, do you know anybody who's just like a normal person who reads all of the documentation? It's 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 like um, you buy a a, a cabinet from IKEA. You don't go through the entire documentation. You just look for the instructions that you absolutely have to have, and usually only half of those. Um, and then, and then when you inevitably, you know, either lose a screw or you put it together wrong, then you go back and find where you missed a spot. But for most people, when they have searched for something, when they need documentation is because they have a specific problem. So they're just looking for that one problem. Uh, so reading all the documentation, I, I was just curious because, uh, like I've read the entire zipper man page from top to bottom. But I'm a fucking nerd. <laughs> I enjoy. I had so much fun reading the the zipper documentation. It was fantastic. I it was. It was an evening. I was bored. I read all of it. It was wonderful. Driest reading you'll ever see. It's just a, reading that is about as slow as zipper itself. But <laughs> that was just a, a, a dig at my beloved zipper. Uh, but any, anyways, you know I'm a nerd. Most people don't do that. But hey, let me. There was something I was going to ask, but now I've completely lost it. It's just. Yeah, I, I lost where I was going. Well, Brain I'm fart. going to say, I'm gonna uh, I, I'm gonna say this. Uh, although I keep touting, uh, telling users to go RTFM, I used to. No, uh, I don't anymore because that's this is part of the things I was doing wrong, and I'm working on rectifying that. But the uh, I keep telling people to RTFM. Used to tell people to RTFM. I haven't read the Arch Wiki ever because, what? yeah, I've I've never read the Arch Wiki. Every time I go to to find a solution, because because of the fact I used to tell people to RTFM, I was like, I need to RTFM myself. Preach, uh, should practice what you preach. So uh, I tried to practice what I preach. As soon as I saw all the technical jargon and techno babble and whatever i was like uh uh no although i'm a distro maintainer not a developer i'm not a developer i'm a distro maintainer so although i'm a distro maintainer i don't understand everything and the arch wiki makes things look so hard that to me i, I consider it the type of wiki that scares people off more than it grabs people's attention you know, I think Steve well, should install Gen okay. 2. <laughs> well, no, no, because if you're scared of the Arch Wiki, the Gen 2 Wiki will eat you, eat well, you no, up and spit the you out. Why I, the reason why I say that, I actually, it, it was funny, but the but beyond that, the Gen 2 Wiki does a much better job of explaining why you're doing things. As long as you don't skip from, you know, uh, well, code box to code box, it does a good job of telling you exactly what you're doing. Now, it doesn't mean yes. that you, it doesn't mean you can go into it like, you know, you, your grandma isn't going to go in there and do it, but, you know, you should be able to do from a, a, a well I, go ahead i i think the sentiment that he's expressing is more of there's a lot of technical jargon in there and that is true like in the arch wiki that's true the gentoo wiki 
That is also true. And I, you're what this, this, that sentiment, I don't disagree with because that is genuinely speaking. I understand that's, that's the reason why most people don't read the Arch Wiki, Gen 2 Wiki, whatever, you, because you load it up, you get this Wiki that walks you through something, but it mentions five different programs or pieces of software that you don't know what do, or like, like a good, a good example would be it linking to or mentioning Pipewire without a link to the page on Pipewire because it assumes you're already doing something with an audio program. You probably know what Pulse Pulse and Pipewire is, whatever. It doesn't link to it. You have no freaking clue what Pipewire is. Then it mentions down a little bit lower that you need like RT kit or something like that for whatever. Like, you know just by glancing over and reading the page, you've already read three or four terms. You don't know what are. And on top of that, it's guiding you through something that you don't know how to do. So you're like, well, I, I've got to go learn what these four things are so I can go with this guide. I don't have time to learn all four of these things. Like I, I get the mentality and the sentiment behind it, but really in all honesty, like m most of the time, like, with with all of those with all that technical jargon in there it's not really a problem but that's like, that's it, an inherent problem with all documentation to some degree don't you think that it, it makes us yeah. it makes some assumptions based on what your prior knowledge is going to be now because there's i can't think of a single example of any documentation that doesn't make some assumptions that you know something along the line so like you when you guys brought up the Hyperland documentation earlier, Hyperland makes the assumption that you know that Hyperland is a window manager and they call it a compositor, whatever, you know, they make the assumption that you know why you would want to see the documentation in the first place. And I'm sure that there are other technical assumptions that they also make somewhere along the line because every, every piece of documentation makes some kind of assumptions. Now we can, we can say that, Things like the Gen 2 wiki, like the Arch wiki, take that those assumptions to a worse degree than they need to. But we also <laughs> here's going to be something funny. Both Gen 2 and Arch, and I'm, I'm sure if there's enough people out there, Linux from scratch, and like basically any distro, they all have their clubs. They're basically like a, a more tame version of the Suckless guys. You know, like on the Suckless website. They literally say this is not for noobs, right? Both Arch and Gentoo have kind of similar attitudes, although less blatant about it. Whereas, you know, they, they like the Arch, the Arch pride, like I use Arch by the way, guys, they have the whole distribution has a pride that they are somewhat difficult to manage and maintain their distro. They like to be complex they like to be like that in gen 2 kind of the same way although i think gen 2 is actually kind of less because they do a much better job of explaining it so they're as odd as it sounds gen 2 feels at least from a documentation standpoint more noob friendly than arch does because arch makes a lot more assumptions i think than gen 2 does doesn't mean that gen 2 doesn't make assumptions about your prior knowledge they do but it doesn't feel as as rough going as the arch guys does um so those assumptions. Well, can the only really problem with you, like, I mean, you are right, but the only problem with recommending Gen two for like, you know, great documentation to people is the documentation's great. It really is, but there is a massive uphill battle with learning at, with learning Portage, and that's only because like the the pack. If you don't know this, we're talking about Gen two, the package manager. So where you're going to install applications, it's named Portage. Portage, you can do anything with Portage. Like, I'm pretty sure if you wanted to like make a cheeseburger with a toaster through Portage, there's some way of doing you it. You can't do that. You, you could do anything. You probably could. I wouldn't be surprised. Now, don't don't Josh, make a bet like that. With the Josh is in the, in the chat saying, yeah, you can do that. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> you, you're right on that though, is that there's some parts of Gen 2 that are, there are just technical, like unmasking things. Like, how are you going to unmask something if you don't? First of all, you have to know the reason why they're masked. What does masking even mean? How do you unmask? Why is it saying all these? Why is everything that I want to install masked? You know, that, that's my experience with Gentoo. Like, man, I, everything yeah. I install, but why is it masked? Just why can't I just install this like a normal fucking distribution? 
I'm going back to our open Sousa. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and I mean, like, that's the stuff that gets most people. Cause like, it, like, it's not that Gen 2 or Portage is like really hard to like do. It's that Gen 2 is set up in a way, like it's already a pretty advanced system for, especially when it comes to the control you have over the system. And then it puts protections to help you from unknowingly breaking your system, like masking packages that are essentially in testing. They're not, they're not really known to be stable at all. So they mask them and keep them back. And then most applications that a lot of people use nowadays are masked in Gentoo because they're not fully what you would consider stable. So like it gets annoying. Like that's, that's my thing right there. I'm right with you on Gentoo. Like once you go over to Gentoo, the, the wiki documentation, great. Once you start using it, you're like, what? what? Can I just install one package without having to make a mask file or adding it? Yeah. Like, come on. <laughs> All right. There's one last thing that I want to talk about before we move on to the nuggies of the week. So, and this pains me, guys. This, like, I hate artificial intelligence with a fucking passion. Like, like with a thousand burning suns, I hate it. Almost as much as I hate cryptocurrency. But that's beside the point. Our AI... Apparently, this time is here to stay, and like we have things like Copilot and J Chat GPT and stuff like that. What do you guys think the role? Just put on your predicting caps here for a second. What do you think the role of AI is going to be when it comes to documentation in the future? Because I'm telling you, man, this is definitely I'm ready. You're, you're definitely going to see some developer who doesn't want to do documentation. They hate documentation, uh -huh. and they're going to go to Chat GPT and they're going to say, "Here, this is my project." Write documentation for me. Uh, you yeah. know it's going to happen if it hasn't happened already. Yeah. So, what do you think? Yeah. What do you think? Yeah. It's yeah. going to be responsible yeah. for creating the worst documentation you've ever read. I'm period. Sure. Bar none. <laughs> stop. <laughs> it's it's, it's that, going to it's it's going to destroy the world. Yeah. See, I it, don't think it'll destroy the world, but it will definitely make it to where you're. All right. Look, you're no, going to know gonna which projects. It's going to create. It's going to create. It's going to create a uh, documentation on how to create the end of the world well you know well, what will end up happening is like these projects that use chat gpt to generate their documentation are going to be used to ex as examples of why we pay people or have people in the community write documentation for us they're gonna like that have like that that will they're gonna have that so will many happen. It, it, so, it will happen yeah so many issues after that happens like like immediately the issues on github are just gonna pile up on top of those like why it, uh, like it says to do this one thing but your documentation says to do another thing and you're it's just all wrong why is it wrong and then and then and then exactly there, there's going to be a scandal okay just like absolutely a scandal of some some major project out there some major open source project that chose to do their documentation through chat GPT or whatever but didn't tell anybody that they did, right? And eventually they're going to have to admit that the reason why there's so many problems in their documentation is because they used AI and then there's going to be the whole thing. Because people are going to use it for documentation, but not tell people that they did for documentation because there's no rules that you have to disclose that kind of thing. What were you going to say, Steve? Sorry, but I'm, you, you, you just said they're, not, they're, they're going to do it without telling anyone they did it. Well... I am the first one to admit that I did use ChatGPT to explain a guide I got from the ArchWiki. I told it, please explain what the ArchWiki means by that. Judas, he is there. <laughs> no, you've infiltrated I, us. What, what is this? <laughs> you can't do this to us. I asked ChatGPT to explain a, a guide I, 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 I didn't understand on the, uh, on the ArchWiki. I told it, "Hey, uh, convert this as if you were uh, it. W it was meant written for a six uh, for a twelve year old." <laughs> Only then did I understand what they meant. So I'm a, I must be a twelve year old, as we in a forty year old knew, body. <laughs> Steve is the problem. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm the first one to admit this. All right. Uh, anything else you guys want to say on this before we move on to the last one? The last section. Okay. Uh, can I get my two minutes now? Or should we leave it to the end? Let's go ahead and wait till after the, the Nuggies of the Week. We'll, we'll give you your minutes, okay? All right. Jump into the, to the Nuggies of the Week. So, Tyler, your Nuggie of the Week, please. Mine, I mean, I was going to make it 
Hugo, but nah, let's let, let's make it something more interesting. So I've been using Sway and C as my notification manager. I can just swap over here and load up a new tab so I don't look bad. And this is my Sway and C. It's a really nice little notification center. I can clear it off. It's got like key bindings for loading up different stuff. It's super easy to configure and use. It's very, very good. I, I could not recommend my notification manager or center to anybody. Sway and C, it's really good. It's very simple to config. So yeah, definitely check it out. All right, Steve, your thingy of the week. My thingy of the week, as I alluded to uh, at the beginning of the, of the episode, my thingy of the week is related to Docker containers. But it, it's, a, it's a Docker container that uh, I fell in love with. It's called Joplin. You only run, it's a not note taking app. I cannot share my screen because it's going to mess up the transforms because I don't have a virtual camera. Cannot have a virtual camera because I use Droid Cam. Both cannot exist, uh, cannot coexist. But anyway, Joplin, is, if you go to Joplin something, the, the link is in the show notes. So uh, whatever. Joplin is a note-taking app that you uh, the Docker container is the server side. It doesn't ha the app doesn't have a web UI, so you run the server as a Docker container on your VPS, and then you access uh, you synchronize from all devices: your computers, your cell phones, your tablets, whatever it may be. But having co full control over the server where you're synchronizing your notes gives me a godlike feeling. Uh, <laughs> Steve, so Steve discovered Docker containers, and all of a sudden his nerddom went from here all the way up to here. <laughs> it's awesome. Thank Kudu for He's that. Joining the dark side. <laughs> <laughs> Thank Kudu and you for that. Then, Both of you guys. Next episode is going to be like, man, this. Kubernetes is freaking awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Let me discover it first. Uh, but uh, Joplin is so amazing. It supports Markdown, it supports HTML, it supports all types of things. And you can give your, uh, you can create books, notebooks. In those notebooks, uh, you get, you put your notes, a collection of notes. And within each note, you put a sub note and whatever. And you can give them icons, emoji icons. Really nifty touch. So it's a simple app, but. Uh, the the server side, the fact that I'm controlling it, haha, makes me feel so freaking powerful and in control. Does your Docker container, baby. <laughs> does your Docker container integrate with the thing that you covered last time? The I forget what it was called. The the Docker Gaz OS. Does it integrate Gaza with that? OS. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it integrates with that, but it's a little bit uh, complex because Casa OS does not support HTTPS, and that one requires HTTPS. Oh, okay. Unless you figure out how to make it work with HTTPS. But I I run a reverse uh, reverse Nginx reverse proxy on my VPS, so I am able to run it via zero Linux .xyz website. So my Joplin server has a URL. My Vault Warden has a URL. I have all my Docker containers that exist on that VPS going through uh, Zero Linux uh, XYZ. So, and I use Dockage, by the way, to to manage all my Docker containers. Mm, okay. I I love Joplin. It's very simple. You have the server. You can install the app on any device you want. You synchronize, and you have full control over what uh, what you do. All right. You add users. You remove users if you want more users on your server or whatnot. So my thingy of the week, just real quickly, you guys know that I've all of a sudden become a gamer again. I've been gaming like fucking crazy. I've been using the Steam Deck, which I have, you know, right here. And yes, there's a Linux Cast sticker on the back because those are stickers. Shop with LinuxCast.org. But I also decided that I wanted to do some gaming on the phone, some mobile gaming. And I wanted a controller to do so. Now, you can just use a regular Bluetooth controller with both Android and iOS. But they make these things that attach to your phone. I'm holding one of these up to the camera. This is called a Backbone controller. It plugs right into your phone. And it's a PlayStation-style controller. And it's pretty good. Now, they have other versions that are better and 
Uh, even there was one that was covered on Retro Game Core uh, yesterday or the day before, something like that, that, that looks better and is actually cheaper than the Backbone. So don't necessarily just buy this one, do some research. But um, this one here is about 100 bucks, and it works really well with Android. It's supposed to work with iOS. I haven't figured that out yet because they're... This is the, is the most stupid thing ever because obviously the iPhone 15 is the first iPhone with USB-C, so the USB-C ones have existed for a while. But on Amazon, the Backbone guys advertise their controller to work with the iPhone 15 series. The problem is, is that they are shipping Backbone controllers without the firmware to work with the iPhone. And on their website, it, this is the fucking stupidest thing ever, it says you must have an Android phone to update the, the controller firmware to use with an iPhone. Like, who actually has... I mean, most people aren't going to have an Android phone if they have an iPhone. They're not going to have both. It's fucking stupid. But anyway, so that's uh, one hit against it. But otherwise, I've been doing some racing games on this, and I'm going to install all my emulators and stuff on this. It's going to be fucking awesome. One thing I will say is that it eats your battery live. So just don't leave it plugged in forever when you're, when you're not using it. Because <laughs> I did that for a while and came back, and oh, my phone was completely dead. But that's awesome. Anyways, that is uh, my Nuggie of the Week. And those are the Nuggies Week. But before we jump into the contact information and all that, Steve had something he needed to say. Yeah, thank you, boss. I uh, It's a two, it's a two maximum three-minute word I need to... It's very hard for me to say this. I'm just saying it here because I, I can't make a YouTube video right now about it. But the gist of it is I need to apologize to all the community who's watching who knows about zero linux i had the uh, I w it was brought brought out to me recently uh, during a certain discussion that took 5 hours the guy the guy who started it all is smiling right now <laughs> but uh, anyway i tend whenever i appear online on any live it was brought to my attention that i keep steering towards zero linux as if zero linux was the only thing in existence that was wrong on my part. I need to apologize from the entire online community and who knows about Zero Linux. And uh, the fact that I wasn't uh, really paying attention to the Discord server and I was I had a, the wrong type of attitude towards, uh, towards the users shouldn't have had that kind of attitude. Now I'm opening up. And the whole structure, the whole structure of, or, or the whole way I react to things has changed, and it's working. Thank, thank you, Tyler. Since you all know who I'm talking about, uh, thank you, Tyler, for that. It was, uh, it was a real heart-to-heart -heart talk, and uh, that's that was the first time I see Tyler talking serious. So. <laughs> And he would. And and he I normally stay from, pretty lighthearted. So, yeah. And uh, you were talking. You were speaking. You were speaking from the heart, and it showed. I needed a, a few. Uh, I needed a few slaps in the face to 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 get to see oh, things the way they were happening. Mm -hmm. But uh, thank you for that. And uh, so far, things are are on the up and up, and they're getting better. And I will try my best to keep an open mind from now on. No more RTFM because I don't even RTFM myself. So I just admitted that <laughs> because the Arch Wiki, every time I go there, it scares the shit out of me. And I tend to use ChatGPT to convert what they say into a 12-year-old, uh, something a 12-year-old can understand. So uh, I understand the uh, I understand you, the user. Uh, that yeah, the Arch Wiki is a bit overwhelming. It can be overwhelming, so I will stop sending you to RTFM, and I will do my best to to help you instead of being dismissive as I used to be. So thank you very much. Uh, hopefully we uh, we can put all the bad things behind us and move on for a better future for Zero Linux. And now Zero Linux will keep on and Z zero linux will will move on as a kde only i had to drop again the gnome and xfce because the people who were helping me maintain it because i couldn't do it on my own left the left the server so i can no longer do it on my own but the code this time around the code is still online on github so anyone who wants to help continue them i'll be more than willing 
as long as I receive help. But alone, I can only do one thing and do it good because I mentioned my situation. I'm not going to mention it again. That's all I can do. And I'm going, uh, and by doing one thing and doing, doing it good, I'll be following the uh, Unix philosophy. So, or Lin, uh, yeah. So uh, I am uh, from now on doing KDE, KDE only, unless somebody's willing to pick up the code and uh, open mindedness through and through no more uh blocking anything and yeah thank you boss that's all i needed that's all the time i needed uh, i'm gl glad you got that out steve but i do want to make one comment about you cl using the words kde and the unix philosophy in the same sentence um <laughs> sorry <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just doing one thing and one I, thing I, good. I knew where That's you were going. I what just I meant. Had to be the joke man. I had, I, I had to take it the opposite <laughs> direction. It's all right. All right. So, if you want to get in contact with us, you can do so in any number of ways. Probably the best way is to head on over to the website, which is soon to have a refresh of some sort. We're gonna. I gotta add some. I haven't been doing a very good job of keeping it updated, but I promise I'm working on it. Head on over there. The linuxcast.org is where you'll find all of that stuff. You'll find all the previous episodes. Most of them anyways. Like I said, working on that. And also previous blog posts that I posted there as well. You can also follow uh, Tyler. He has a YouTube channel where he's actually been posting stuff and streaming. And it's amazing. It's like he went like a whole, almost whole year without doing anything. He lost his password. Then he's now he's back. It's amazing. He's alive again. Uh, Zany is available on YouTube and Odyssey, at, uh, I believe, at uh, YouTube.com slash ZanyOG. I, I don't know about the Odyssey part. I don't know. Does anybody use Odyssey anymore? Probably not. Um, rambling man. <laughs> I, I know I know his videos are still getting synced there because I see them. Um, but anyways, YouTube.com slash ZanyOG. Oh. Is it Tyler what? Uh, be before we completely move on, since it, since we are talking about my channel, just so you know, I'm going to be doing a Zero AD stream later, probably with some of these people in here. And if Matt would narrate it, that would be incredible. But we'll see about that. He's a busy man, so never know. I might be but around later, like cool. after supper, but we'll see. Uh, anyways, uh, Steve is on Fossadon, Fossadon.org slash at Zero Linux. Zero with an X is where you'll find him. Uh, you can also find me at youtube.com slash the Linux cast. Uh, you can find all of our contact information at the Linux cast.org slash contact. There you'll find the discord servers for all three of us, Mastodon links and all that kind of stuff there. That way you don't have to, you know, actually, you know, type that stuff in because laziness is the name of the game. Also, if you want to support the channel, you can do so by heading on over to the merch store where you'll find a lot of awesome freaking merch if i do say so myself that includes desk mats and t-shirts and stuff like that uh so go head on over there shop.linuxcast.org you can support me on patreon at patreon.com slash linuxcast i swear the section gets longer every week patreon.com slash linuxcast for patreon also on ko-fi and youtube and all that stuff so uh that's it for the contact information we record this live every saturday at three o'clock p.m eastern time or at least most saturdays we have i believe two episodes left uh, after this one, we have uh, another I, I, another topic from one of us, and then we're playing a Linux trivia game for the last episode of the year. So we have th those things to look forward to. It's going to be really fun, so make sure you hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, and all that nonsense. Thanks to everybody who does support me on Patreon and YouTube. You guys are all absolutely amazing. Without you, the channel just would not be anywhere near where it is right now. So thank you so very much for your support, as always. Uh, we will be back uh, next Saturday with another awesome episode, so... See you then.